Okay, everyone. So we're going to start with our next speaker, Susan Flash, and uh, she's going to speak at a conference it's titled "Learning What Not to Say But When: A Case Study in Morphological Constraint Acquisition." Okay. Um. Thanks, Christoph. Um. We all had a very short night, I assume. <laughs> Not noise. Four years ago, we were in Belgium for ICE gel. When Germany won, except the Belgians didn't cause that stink for uh, the Germans, obviously. Um, but I had my ta talk uh, first thing in the morning back then. So, okay, um, let's start. What um, I'll talk about is a case study in morphological constraint acquisition. It's part of my or was part of my PhD um, project on the go verb construction. The GVERB construction is subject to a constraint, and the question then is, from an acquisitional perspective, how do children acquire that constraint if morphology doesn't occur in the input? How does that proceed? Um, the GVERB construction, I go, go get the uh, newspaper every morning, let's go find a paragraph marker, is interesting and idiosyncratic because it doesn't allow inflections. Any inflections will be ruled ungrammatical, and they do not occur in corpora. We heard the best M constraint in Martin's talk, so that was a bit of a lead-in. Um, that's a prime example of that best M constraint, and it has been addressed almost exclusively from uh, generative uh, perspectives, where it's seen as the output of morphosyntactic or paramatic um, operations. From a usage-based perspective, um, the discussions pertain to different aspects of the construction. But I uh, proposed in my um, dissertation that the constraint is actually functionally uh, conditioned because not only is the construction subject to a morphological constraint, it's also subject to a semantic <coughs> constraint. And I argue that um, that's a bit of a coincidence because the morphological constraint actually follows non-causally from the semantic constraint because of English uh, morphology. So what did I do? Um, Usage-based perspective asked the question, um, What's the construction used uh, for? What's the context of use? And usually you find um, an overwhelming use of the construction in the and I infinitives. Know. However, if we ask the question what the construction is used for, uh, or from a functional perspective, then we see orders, suggestions, commands, um, encouragements, invitations, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, um, if we know that um, that dictum, you shall know a word that a company keeps in the case of the construction, you shall know a construction that a company keeps. Not only do we have imperatives where that mapping is relatively straightforward between form and function, you also have infinitives um, that contain matrix verbs, requested matrix verbs, uh, let's constructions, uh, geontic modals, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, that infinitive category is far too coarse-grained, so if we recode them, then we could pair form with function to actually characterize the construction as a mandative construction. So whatever I say about go verb equally applies to come verb, it's just that we have different uh, path semantics. And once we have made that observation, you can actually just purely on the basis of what does occur, make an informed inference on what does not occur, uh, because some of the inflected uses are not licensed by the schema which has to satisfy the three conditions, participant, function, and uh, scene configuration, such as in go get a job, let's go have a drink. Um, you have speaker and hearer, they wrap straightforwardly onto mandate and uh, It's a directive or a permissive, and the act of suggesting to go have a drink precedes the actual event of having the drink. Extensions from that call with requested matrix verbs, I told him to go see a doctor and he was invited to come visit um, that may extend to third parties, but we still have mandate and mandate T. Um, the function is indirect, and the event structure is unaffected, even though it may be shifted along a temporal um, axis. An extension would be um, complement structures, infinitival complements. He was about to go jump. We have no deontic source, um, but there is encodive or imminency um, relevant there, so we have a reference point that precedes the um, event itself. So that's what usually what we call uh, non-assertive context, what hasn't actually happened yet. By contrast, the um, in English inflectional context, they encode something very different, uh, such as um, 
there's no deontic source, there's no mandate and mandatee in that sense. We have a representative function rather than a commissive or a directive, and the event structure is obviously all over the place um, as well. So that's generally what we refer to as um, assertive. This way, we can formulate that something is more likely to occur above chance in corpora if it's closer to the schema core. In other words, if it receives license by um, the schema itself. Um, one awkward case that kind of doesn't fit that picture very well is uh, their indicatives, but research actually shows that corpus data show that they are less, much less frequent, they're quite idiosyncratic, and they're also judged um, not as acceptable as some of the uh, examples to the top. Okay, so that in a sense they well they satisfy the morphological constraint, but they violate the semantic constraint uh, there. Okay, what did I do then? I'll briefly go into the adult data to illustrate the method and the distribution um, in language use. Um, I coded all users of the construction um, according to their leftward syntactic uh, environment, and here they're ordered in um, terms of uh, schema compatibility, so the top ones are more um, typical of the construction, whereas the bottom ones are not. I coded, here I'm showing a representative sample of a thousand users of each of the uh, types. And we see um, that the rates of imperatives are relatively high, it's highest for the serial constructions, a bit lower for the coordinated ones. And the indicative rate is really, really low, uh, again, uh, with a stronger skew for the serial constructions. The question is whether that's actually surprising, because it could just be that we have near 30% of imperatives in usual uh, corpora and indicatives only around about 5 to 10 percent. There are coded um, control group um, of bare verbs that are not auxiliaries or any of the four constructions, and we see the mirror image here. So there's quite a diverging um, distribution. Beyond that, it's a bit difficult to see structure in that data. Uh, so we use multidimensional scaling techniques to uh, visualize um, the distribution and something that's more similar will be plotted um, closer to each other, um, and something that's more dissimilar will be plotted further apart. So we're familiar with that from many corpus linguistic studies. And I used uh, correspondence analysis, uh, which plots both the columns and the rows. So we get to the rows in a second. So for the columns, the constructions, um, I hope you can see it's a bit small. But basically, we see a continuum from the control corpus use via the um, coordinated uses onto the serial uses. So this continuum um, is visualized uh, there. If we plot in the rows, which is the syntactic environment, um, is what I call or refer to as construction ecology, um, then we see that the serial verbs over here are predominantly associated with um, <coughs> highly mandative or hortative constructions. Uh, whereas the control group over here is clearly uh, with, associated with assertive constructions um, or unmarked, what I call unmarked um, to infinitival uh, complements. Okay, so that's a general idea. We'll revisit this type of diagram um, later on in one of the case studies. Okay, so how do children now acquire this constraint? Because obviously there's no inflected input. Um, there's no preemptive construction, really. It's just that construction, how do they know uh, that this uh, does not inflect? Okay, there's one um, study, um, we'll go into that in a, in a second. And the question is, um, when do children have knowledge of an innate parameter? So that was the question that was asked from a generative uh, perspective. From a construction or usage-based perspective, we would ask the question, when do children acquire the schema? So previously, the claim in that study was that children have an awareness of the parameter by age two, and they um, base it on the fact that by their second birthdays, children have the first clear use of the construction. The problem is, of course, what's the first clear use? Um, because if we're looking for something that does not inflect, that's the more basic, the unmarked case, then obviously naturally we would expect children to produce that very early, even though they're not using the construction. And that's precisely what we uh, find. Go get it, mommy. Okay, you go get the sheet. 
I go play, I go and talk on the phone. But we're not really sure, if, are these actually uses of the construction or is it something um, else? The second problem is that, or what's more, or what's closer to the truth in acquisition data is that we have these pivot uses where we don't really know what type of construction um, it, we actually put it to. Want to go per, put, Papa go put my jammies on, and in the last case, um, that's actually not an imperative uh, because the dad is not in the immediate vicinity of the uh, situation. Okay, and what we also find is that there's frequent and continuous use of assertives, and they are inflected relative to uh, the morphological maturity of uh, the children, such as, Mom, we go and see that kind of snake, Jesus, go turn, because the axis of inflection, it goes fall in the grass, it goes save children, and then by, even at age 10, we find he goes, shoots a blank, and they hit it, and it breaks. What this shows, however, is that children seem to have a very, very different representation of the schema by that age. And we can now ask the question uh, from a usage-based perspective. How do children acquire the schema in two parts? How do children approach adult use? So they're very dissimilar at the beginning and they become more similar towards um, maturation. And then schematization. How does the schema representation, supposedly based on the output, proceeds across um, Childhood. Okay. I uh, exploited all the child's corpora of North American English. That's 41 from 1970s to 2000s. The construction did not change that much during that time, so that is relatively representative. Um, I extracted more data for GOVA. That's why I focus on GOVA. And interestingly, um, Cumberg shows a very, very different picture, but we may have time for that in the discussion. Annotation, each observation was annotated for these syntactic environments that we had in the adult data, with the exception that I introduced the pivot um, category, um, especially in the early ages um, of child development. And then each observation was also coded for the age of the child, um, both in input and output tokens. Okay. The first case study is the difference between input and output. Um, how do children become more similar towards their parents. In um, the first age cohort for which we have data, you'd see a distribution here such as this, where it's a mirror image, children tend to use more indicatives and parents tend to use more um, <coughs> imperatives and the other way around. Um, later on by their third birthdays, that has changed slightly. Okay, to become more similar, distribution is not as extreme. How can we measure um, the similarity here? I treat each of these tables as um, a chi-square test and use the Kramer's V as an effect size, which ranges between zero and one. So one would be more dissimilar and zero would be um, not distinguishable. So for the first period, very high dissimilarity for the second period, relatively uh, low dissimilarity. Okay, we plot um, these according uh, to this diagram, we see a relatively quick um, approach towards adulthood, but it stops. Uh, so if you overlay a cluster analysis, uh, you have clusters, um, relatively prolonged period between the third birthday and the fifth birthday. So, and actually it seems that it's going up again, so they're becoming more dissimilar across time. So we keep that in mind later. The second um, perspective is schematization. How does the use of the construction by children uh, proceed across uh, time? And here I'm using the same principle that we had in the uh, diagram before with correspondence analysis, except that I'm not using uh, the constructions as columns, but the age cohort. So that's a bit of a pseudo, uh, pseudo um, time uh, progression. And what we see from this table is that children use all syntactic environments at all times, except for something that's really, 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 really infrequent. Um, so that's not just purely based um, or due to their um, syntactic uh, maturity. Okay, the results here, and I hope you can see it, I'll walk you through there. Uh, we see several, time, uh, several types of uh, progression. So the first one is by age, and uh, it's indicated by this line, it goes from early um, around the second birthdays onto three 
four out of five. So um, this line is drawn by the data. Okay, so I didn't impose that line on the data. So the, um, there is this clear uh, progression, which is also clear in semantics. So early childhood is more associated with the pivot uses, naturally, um, and then indicatives. And then we move on to semi-modals, which is intentional, um, onto modal verbs uses, onto more imperative uses. Yes, so imperative uses are clearly associated with um, later periods. There is, however, also um, a progression in complexity, obviously. So they first start out with very simple structures, onto monoclausal structures, onto biclausal stru structures, but even the imperatives, which are arguably relatively simple, syntactically speaking, um, they will only come very late. So that doesn't explain the progression in total either. Okay, one question that you could ask, well, are children just copying what they hear in the input? They clearly don't. Um, if we plot, that's the adult plot next to it, so um, there is absolutely no age progression within the input that children receive. Um, and likewise, there's no semantic uh, progression here either. There is a slight tendency, if we enlarge that slightly, uh, there's a bit of a tendency that with two-year-olds, you tend to use let's, and with five-year-olds, you tend to use imperatives, so there's a bit of discourse uh, difference, but otherwise, it's um, they sort of seem to receive relatively homogeneous input, yet they, um, children show that uh, clear progression uh, there. Okay, what are my conclusions from this study? Well, we started out with a couple of questions, and depending on the question, you can make um, certain um, inferences. If you ask the question, when do children have knowledge of the parameter, um, then obviously you only pertain to um, morphology, but you have to exclude uh, semantics. Conversely, we can cover both if we ask it from an um, acquisitional uh, perspective, a usage-based perspective. And the construction Instructional acquisition proceeds in um, first that they first have a representative or a compositional um, use of the construction that narrows down towards um, uh, the uh, non assertive um, core um, that ca characterizes adult uh, speech, which is actually very similar to the historical development. So it did start out as an assertive construction in Old English, and we see that progression over time um, as well. Obviously, that schematization is also uh, gradual. And um, there is a conspicuous period of um, starting to talk worse uh, between the ages three and four. Uh, so that's where children become uh, more dissimilar, again, towards their, uh, to the input that they're faced with. And something seems to, seems to be going on. There's not much progression. We saw that in a little block um, in the second um, case study. And that is quite reminiscent of this phenomenon that started to talk worse. Children do not produce overgeneralization in morphology, but they do so after the second birth, they when they um, extract um, uh, schema there. Okay, so the question, how does that relate now to the constraint acquisition? Clearly, children have don't have inflected input. Um, so the fact that they do use inflections um, shows that they don't just copy uh, the input of um, uh, the adults. So they have to use indirect negative evidence uh, to deduct that there is a constraint um, in the input. However, okay, so and how does indirect negative evidence usually work? Well, in a negative evidence work, you compare your expectations to the observations. Okay, you know, like I should expect um, inflection here, but I don't. And then you adjust your expectations. The problem is um, that presupposes that you have an expectation. So if you don't have an expectation, you can't know that the expectation doesn't match your observation, which means that this presupposes that children need an abstract knowledge of the inflectional schema in general. Okay? Um, in less fancy terms, that's basically the constraint acquisition parallels their morphological acquisition as well. Um, so. Uh, one, uh, just before we um, head off there, uh, that's a graph of the overgeneralization progression. Okay, so uh, that's the overgeneralization of uh, past tense forms. In the beginning, children make very few 
generalization errors, and then they, they um, sort of jump on considerably before they drop off. But that progression is relatively long, and it takes them quite a while up, up until about their fifth birthday before they uh, sort of drop to um, much lower levels. If we overplot that with the progression that we saw in uh, becoming more similar towards their parents, we see that near parallel development here. So children become very um, similar to their parents very quickly, but then start to talk, talk worse, so to speak, and that takes them quite a lot of time to reach um, pre-talking worse uh, levels. Okay, and that's me. Thank you. <laughs> First acquisitional step, you're saying the uh, this construction is um, compositional rather than schematic. It's the assertive step, the first one. Uh, what do you draw this conclusion from? Could it, couldn't it be schematic but not not adult schematic? Yes, I think that's a thanks. Um, that's a very unfortunate use of the term schematic. Um, it could. I mean, so, obviously, so could. what's the contrast between compositional and schematic there? Oh, I think I meant schematic in the term of the schema that adults have. So the sort of as the pattern that adults have, like the core pattern would be imperatives and abortatives and so on, uh, whereas children use it in in the complete opposite end of the scale. So they use it in the con compositional um, representative assertive, whichever one of these um, terms you want to use. So I think that was the um, how I understood schematic in that sense. It doesn't mean that children don't have a schema of their own, but that would be very different to the adult schema. But so. that would be fun to describe, right? Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure. What is the form, what's the function there? Yeah. yeah, I think I fell prey to the same problem that a lot of um, the generative ideas do in assuming that children have adult skills rather than, so that, that you describe children's use of language in adult terms rather than describing it in their own terms. So, yeah, thanks. You, you had some beautiful examples of the overgeneralization. Can you just remind us of like one of them? Um, and then he goes, shoots, and it breaks. So, I, I wonder if the way they learn to avoid that is that they would hear in that kind of context, then he goes and shoots, right? And they would always hear that. So, so then they would have a more accessible alternative for that kind of meaning. So they don't have to necessarily expect and be corrected, but it gets they learn something else. To yeah, replace yeah, I've, yeah. That they, they do have a bit of a preempting construction there. Uh, is that a question or more of a comment? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I actually didn't look into the coordinated uh, constructions of how they acquired. So I would have to. I, I guess it could be you know the kid has something they want to say, and they don't. They haven't learned the adult way to say it, so they use what they have, it, and they extend this in, in a way that you know they haven't heard. Yeah, yeah. I mean. <clears throat> It, it kind of does make sense that usually these types of examples do occur with the most frequent verbs as well. Um, and the most frequent verbs are also usually prone to um, inflections in adult speech as well. Uh, which may be a frequency effect, obviously, that if you the high, the more associated ones, the frequent ones, they're also more, more likely to be um, inflected. I mean, there are a couple of, of, that, um, of these examples. So... Um, yeah, that, that's a difficult, a tough call, like whether to describe these inflections in terms of the go verb constructions or whether to take the go and verb construction into consideration as well. I think there's one more context that we didn't mention, which is in the if clause. Um, if he goes, if, if I go by any car, if they, if you, but not if he go by any car. And so 
Uh, I guess that could be a relevant explanation why that song could be Again, why shouldn't we, like, why should you regard uh, uh, Y as unreflected in the case of a pure break away from song? I, I've been sort of struggling with that fact as well, but the, the construction you're describing is um, I classified them as indicative. Um, there are very unusual indicatives, and they're very rare, but if indicatives do occur, they actually tend to occur in conditionals. Um, so I've always a bit struggled with why is it fine to use it in the bare form if I go buy a car, but not if he goes buy a car. Um, that's, that's more or less a, a, a cutoff between that semantic constraint. He can violate semantic constraint more easily than he can violate a hard morphological constraint because it's so entrenched with the, um, the bare forms. Um, that occasionally you find examples like, and then if he goes, buys, and then some like self correction goes and buys, and they're sort of the, because it, it seems for people obviously are more happy with violating a semantic constraint than they are with violating um, a hard, almost hard morphological uh, constraint. <coughs> Go back and look at the, the plot of the schematization of these options. I was just thinking about this complexity. So this is a this is a binary uh, plot. So you've got complexity as well as you had three things. Maybe this wasn't the right plot. One, one of the plots should have complexity in there as well. Just oh, you mean the the explanation here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's an ordinary simple. Correspondence analysis. But the complexity is one of the factors in it, is that right? Uh, that's one of my interpretations. So they start with simple constructions, um, and then most of the constructions down here actually by clauses rather than monoclausal. That was just, uh, that wasn't in, that's not in the plot, that's an interpretation of my. I was just thinking because maybe it's the structured by complexity and not by. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that could be could be right, especially these ones in in, in uh, particularly the why don't we go see a movie construction that is so complex that it actually only occurs with five year olds. Um, however, imperatives are arguably relatively straightforward, and I don't have children, but I've been told that children as young as two use lots of imperatives. Um, so that doesn't explain it. If, if, if you had enough data, you could read all the examples. Uh, no, but what could be done relatively straightforwardly um, is a sample, code a sample of use, child use that is not the go-go construction and see how they use it and then compare it. Thanks. I think we should stop now because it's time for lunch. So thank you very much.